Hi. I'm really excited to be here and speak about Scandit and our journey from the lab to the market that we've experienced over the last 14 years. So 14 years ago on this day, we actually founded the business. So it's quite a memorable moment for me to reflect about some of the early years and what we've learned from moving again out of the lab and figuring out how to go to market, how to sell our product. So um, besides speaking about this journey a little bit, I'm also going to be speaking about how during these early years, we've been able to leverage the academic environment, how we've been able to leverage that ecosystem that at the time, 14 years ago, certainly wasn't as developed as what I'm staring at now, um, uh, and certainly not uh, where we founded the business in Switzerland. I will also speak a little bit about um, uh, some of the finer aspects, technology transfer as an example, that clearly for any more deep tech focused company are important. And then I will also have some thoughts and reflections on how to making sure there is good alignment, not just at the beginning, but then over time between the founders that ultimately uh, are driving the business forward. So with that, um, I'd like to start with a quick video to help you guys understand what it is we're actually doing at Scandit. So I'll play this right now. Okay, so as you guys saw in the video, what we do at Scandit is all about empowering frontline workers, consumers, and the businesses behind these organizations with what we call smart data capture solutions, which is a fancy term for machine learning and computer vision based uh, algorithms or models to help recognize the identity of an object, a barcode, a price label and thereby enabling interactions with physical goods in retail or logistics settings. As I mentioned at the outset, we, we founded Scandit uh, just 14 years ago um, in uh, 2009, actually, um, as a spin-off company of ETH Zurich. Um, and before that, uh, my two co-founders had already been working, Christoph and Christian, the guy on the uh, black shirts, Christian, our uh, C2 and VP product, the guy with the fancy white blue shirt is Christoph, who heads up our engineering organization. So those two guys have already been working on um, research projects in the domain of ubiquitous computing and Internet of Things. And from there, uh, the foundation was established that then later on became what Scandit is today. All three founders remain in the business, uh, active parts of the leadership team today. Now again, if we fast forward to today, we're fortunate enough to be able to serve 
many of the leading retail and logistics companies worldwide. We have more than 2,000 customers worldwide with a team of more than 400 talented individuals across uh, seven office locations globally. Now, it wasn't always like this, right? And so the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to briefly give you guys a sense for how we managed to go from vision to reality. So I mentioned um, our beginnings at ETH Zurich, and specifically um, the place where it all began was the ubiquitous computing lab at ETH Zurich, where both Christoph and Christian, my two co-founders, got their PhDs from. In those times, there was a research project uh, that was focused on a big idea. The idea was to leverage a mobile phone. These things were called mobile phones at the time, not smartphones, um, to enable interactions with physical objects. And there were different ways uh, on how this could be accomplished at, uh, uh, from, from, from the perspective of those days. On the one hand, and you see that behind me, there was one idea that would have people put RFID chips on physical objects. For example, consumer products in retail stores, on toys in a, uh, kid's, um, uh, in a kid's room. And then you would touch the toy or the product with the phone and start to interact with it. For example, the toy would start to talk to you. Um, another idea was to use visual markers. You can see that on the other side, um, on the slide. And then use the camera of the phone to recognize the marker and thereby start that dialogue. Now, reading a visual marker, as I indicated before, was actually something brand new. Uh, Nokia had only just launched a camera phone just some years earlier, and the iPhone had not happened yet. So that was sort of the time and context when we started. A big question that quickly emerged, though, was why, instead of these visual markers, we wouldn't just use the barcodes that were naturally already applied on products. And that triggered a first additional research project and initiative that would look into building algor uh, uh, dedicated algorithms that would help the uh, phone become a phone that can read barcodes, regular one-dimensional barcodes that you find on any consumer product around the world. So after a while, the first algorithms have been developed that could accomplish just that, namely read a barcode on a one megapixel camera without an autofocus and do that somewhat reliably. Um, and uh, with that, um, the team went to work to um, look into different applications. For example, applications to do price comparison in store by holding the phone against the product and see where that same product can be bought for a cheaper price. Or to access sustainability related information or information about allergens that you might find in products. So that was the time when we started. Now, the technology itself, as you realize quickly when we started to test this in the field, didn't work that well in those days. Um, for example, uh, we could only recognize a, a couple of thousand codes with the algorithms that we had in the early days, or, or the algorithm would produce um, false results, which naturally isn't quite, quite valuable. Uh, nonetheless, as we continue to build out the capability of the product, the technology, we were starting to wonder how to bring the technology to market, right? And as you can see on the slide behind me, we were looking at different potential business models and routes to market. One route being licensing the technology to smartphone vendors um, directly. Another route being licensing the technology to application developers so they could incorporate scanning into all the different apps that they were thinking about. And another idea was to uh, launch our own apps that would then be differentiated with better technology from others. So that's what we started with in the end, after a lot of reflection. We thought with really good differentiated scanning, great product information, and a, um, a cool way of tying in social into this 
uh, product, we could launch a mobile price comparison app, a mobile shopping companion application ourselves. And so we did. And in fall 2010, at TechCrunch Disrupt in San Francisco, we launched our very own Scandid mobile shopping application. Um, focused on electronic products with really good scanning, great um, integration into Facebook and Twitter, X today. Um, and we had this big launch. And then we did see some reasonable adoption. People downloaded the app, started to use it, etc. What we didn't see was the exponential hockey stick development. However, what did happen was that a lot of developers started to reach out to us and inquire about whether or not they could be using our technology in their app. So the other option that we have been contemplated. And so quite quickly, we went back to this idea, um, started to build out a licensing platform that would allow developers to trial, learn more about, and then finally purchase our software development uh, kits and, and, and barcode scanning libraries. And from there, we went on to launch a proper online licensing offers uh, at the next upcoming Disrupt conference in spring 2011. Now, with that initial success and some first licensing business that started to come to us, of course, we started to wonder now, OK, how do we take this forward? Where do we focus? Because as you may have realized, there are a lot of use cases, a lot of potential applications where barcode scanning could be useful. And as any startup, at the time we were just a few people, it's hard, right? You can't focus on anything, everything at once. So we needed to find the areas in the market that we could focus on. So what we did was we started to look at the main market segments, the key use cases within those segments, and started to ask ourselves three key questions. First, how many end customers and how many end users within those end customers exist? Second, um, what's the value of this use case in regards to scanning? We quickly realized that scanning frequency is, is, is quite essential to be able to judge that. And then third, of course, we needed to look at the capabilities, the scan performance robustness of our algorithms at the time and find the perfect match. So find the use cases that are large and valuable enough that we can solve for, that have a real customer need that we can address. So that's what we did. And that's how we ended up starting a more proactive marketing approach to consumer-facing shopping applications uh, that at the time we were able to serve with a differentiated product. From there, we then went on to selling the same capabilities to retailers who were in response to the many independent mobile applications, starting to build their own mobile shopping apps. So we started to successfully sell into the retail ecosystem. And from there, we started to tackle harder and harder and more valuable use cases for scanning and associated um, data capture capabilities within those established customer accounts. So that, in a nutshell, was our path to market that we have been following ever since. So over the next 10 years, really, we've been doing more of that and um, uh, stuck to those systematic ways of segmenting the market, looking for value, and uh, building out our product offering to match the needs of the pertinent use cases within the industries that we've been serving. So on the product side, that meant we moved from being a single product-focused barcode scanning company to a much more broadly, to, to a much more broadly focused uh, multi-product portfolio company that has barcode scanning, ID capture, um, facings detection, smart label capture, and so on, that retailers could use or logistics companies require to improve their processes. Um, we also moved from a single device focus, focus on smartphones only, to a set of, a broader set of camera equipped smart devices, some of which you've seen in the video. Next, on the go-to-market side, 
as I mentioned, as we moved from the independent early movers in the mobile app economy, the independent consumer app developers, to the retailers, we started to dip our toes into the enterprise software licensing market. And we quickly realized that not only are the business problems, the workflows more complex, but there is also more value, more value to be captured and created on that front. So we focused on moving upwards into the enterprise market segment. And at the same time, we also started to turn around our go-to-market approach from a very inbound content marketing focus to a very outbound account-based marketing focus approach. And then last, to support this transition and journey, of course, we needed to build the organization uh, to be able to grow and support the product development alongside. So that, in a nutshell, is our journey from going to the lab to the market. Now, in the next few minutes, what I'd like to touch on are four areas um, that have been useful to us in those early years specifically, and that really have helped us either um, be smarter about how we go to market, be more resourceful um, from a cost and uh, funding perspective, uh, and also bet in the right amount of optionality to make sure that how we're spinning out of this context and how the technology uh, that we've built in the academic environment still is accessible and ultimately beneficial, not just to us, but to all parties involved. So first, I'd like to briefly talk about how we've been able to leverage the academic environment during those early years. As mentioned, um, in the early years, coming out of this academic context and environment, both of my co-founders, Christian and Christoph, still um, uh, had some ongoing pro re research project work that they uh, were, were delivering against. And initially not so consciously, but then very consciously, we dis decided to keep, to keep these research projects going on the one hand, to make sure we can continue to tap into the economic environment, we can access um, uh, resources such as uh, space, equipment, uh, we can access talent, on engineering talent specifically, by offering master thesis, um, uh, semester thesis, or even PhD work um, to professors, and in return, uh, continue to benefit from that ecosystem. Um, second, we continued, by keeping these close relationships with our professors, we were able to tap into joint R&D projects that not only helped us advance the, the, harder issue, the harder technological problems that we were looking to solve on the computer vision side, but at the same time, it also came with some part-time funding that we were able to uh, tap into. And then last, coming from this academic context also gave us exclusive access to some programs and networks that was only accessible at the time to uh, spin-outs of academics institutions, such as dedicated market entry camps for uh, North America, for example, that we were able to leverage, or um, uh, the ability to access specific coaching or be able to compete in entrepreneurship competitions that came with pretty hefty prize money. Uh, which fortunately we were able to win and thereby access non-dilutive financing, which otherwise would have meant we would have had to raise seed funding that would have diluted uh, the shareholder base. So that's, the, that's how we managed to leverage that economic environment uh, in a mutual be mutually beneficial manner. Second, I already indicated the importance uh, that the academic context had for us from a talent uh, identification and access perspective. So from the early years on, we were able to uh, identify key engineering talent early on by uh, offering um, compelling masters or research project work to them and ultimately testing the best talent and hold on to some of them. And so not surprisingly, our first full-time hire was an ETH engineer whom we brought on uh, to our team as the first full-time um, uh, staff member. 
Uh, doing this also allowed us to stay up to date on relevant research and keep that steady influx of key talent that would bring with them relevant research know-how. Um, so over the years, we've hired tens of uh, uh, engineers from uh, ETH Zurich and related uh, academic institutions. And in an uh, environment where, of course, uh, talent is scarce and uh, uh, um, competed about, uh, this has been a great value add for us. Next, IP transfer. So again, as for any um, deep tech focused uh, technology startup or scale up, it is incredibly important to be able to protect your IP and not, not only build out your IP, but also uh, uh, have a strategy on how to look after it. In our case, the challenge was that some of the IP that we had created, we had created in a university context. So we needed to find the right way to um, negotiate how to uh, be able to leverage that IP for commercial purposes. And the way we accomplished that was to negotiate um, agreements for distinct um, uh, go-to-market scenarios. So I spoke recent, uh, previously about the scenario of licensing to smartphone vendors or of licensing to developers. So we ended up negotiating different types of licensing models for all these scenarios, which later on became handy as we finally figured out how to really go to market. So again, remember, at the time when we spun out, we didn't really have this figured out. So retaining that optionality from a licensing perspective was essential to us. And then further on down the path, as we went through um, uh, several uh, funding rounds um, and, and started to look at also uh, uh, acquisitions, it became important that we were able to have full control over the IP and have some optionality uh, to be able to uh, accomplish that. So, very important point that at the time when you're spinning out of an academic context clearly may not be that obvious and it may not be that obvious why that optionality might come handy, but it certainly um, makes it much easier if further down the road those scenarios um, arise. So, last point. Um, and that's, of course, not specific to the academic context. Um, and that's about founder alignment. So clearly, as with any founder team, it is essential uh, to maintain an aligned vision uh, in, uh, over time and not just at the beginning. At the beginning, everyone's excited. Everyone starts out with that shared vision. Otherwise, you would not have decided to found a company. Found a company. But clearly, as time elapses, it's important to come back to that vision, to debate it, to realign on it, and make sure uh, that everyone stays aligned. A second key point is, of course, on making sure there is some complementary um, uh, nature of how the founder team is, um, is, 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 is coming together. Now, clearly, when you look at the image behind me, uh, these three guys don't look like a hyper-diverse crowd. Right? So nothing, sadly, we can do about this. It's just, it was just what, <laughs> what the facts were. However, um, not so surprisingly, um, uh, the, the three individuals that you're looking at actually have very distinct passions, skills, and wants. And by recognizing that, we were able to make sure that the way we went about defining our respective roles and how we then, more importantly, went about defining the scope of everyone's roles made sense as the needs of the business changed over time. Another key point that I believe is not to be underestimated in this context is <clears throat> actually aligning the timeline of when a team spins out fully or really gets started, right? I oftentimes see startups fail on this very point, right? Because three people come together or four people come together, they're all super excited about um, uh, starting up and building a company, only to realize that after a year, one or two guys, they don't ever fully pull the plug. They don't ever fully lean in and get going, right? 
uh, because they maintain a part-time relationship somewhere. In our case, as I mentioned, we made a very conscious decision to maintain uh, for a while part-time research engagements at our, um, at our alma mater. Um, however, it, it was also equally important that at the right time we decided when that would have to stop and when we needed to free ourselves from those uh, original dependency because um, the balance between the value we were getting and what we were giving up or the opportunity cost didn't feel right any longer. So uh, it's also something to think about. And then very importantly, uh, I believe it is very important to maintain a very good ongoing relationship in a founding team, right? Um, if you operate like us in a founding relationship over 14 years, right? That's like being married, right? It really is a, a way to get to learn, get to know someone, right? Um, and there are many things you would not have imagined. So investing in those relationships, spending time with each other outside of defined agendas, even if it's just going for coffee on a very regular basis, I think pays back many times and helps address especially the finer, the cultural issues. Uh, and that's something I would heavily recommend. So with that in mind, so is it a good idea to start a university spin out and can these be successful? Well, judging from a single statistical run so far, so good from a scanned perspective. I cannot say it hasn't worked for us. However, of course, uh, many others have started at the same time uh, as we did and did, were not as fortunate to get to this level. So uh, I certainly uh, want to recognize this. Uh, so there is a key role of timing, of luck along the way, despite everyone trying their best. Uh, again, as a quick summary, what worked for us is leveraging the resources in the academic environment, uh, making sure we're identifying key engineering talent early on, being very mindful of how we uh, managed uh, our IP transfer and then looking after our founder relationships early on. Thank you.